Thanks, Selena. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day three of the Cal OER conference. My name is Shelley Winance. I'm one of the California State University representatives on the Cal OER organizing committee. Before we jump into our keynote session this morning, I'd like to thank and recognize our sponsors. A huge thank you goes out to all five of our sponsors for supporting this conference. Their generosity is greatly appreciated and helped make everything happen for this conference. I'm excited about our last keynote session of the conference. We are going to get to learn about the latest results from Bayview Analytics annual OER survey for higher education in the US and learn about trends in the findings with an analysis of how California compares to its regional colleagues. Uh, I'd like to introduce and welcome our two keynote presenters today and tell you a little briefly about them. We welcome both Dr. Julia Seaman and Dr. Jeff Seaman. Julia brings a background in pharmaceutical chemistry and healthcare consulting work to her current position as Director of Research at Bayview Analytics. Although she's published across a wide range of topics, she currently concentrates on statistical and survey analysis projects in scientific and educational research. Jeff's work in educational information technology and his multiple discipline degrees complement his research in the impact of technology in higher education and K-12, and the work he does on academic technology boards, along with his director role at Bayview Analytics. Now I'm gonna turn things over to our keynote presenters to take us on an OER data journey. Hi, and everyone, and thank you, Shelley, for that great introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting us for the keynote presentation. Um, it's been a great uh, few days seeing the uh, OER presentations that have come before us, um, and we're honored to be here to present for everyone. Um, so I will begin with my slides. And so uh, basically this presentation, uh, Crunching the OER Numbers, uh, will be a review of our most recent survey um, that we'll be going through. And so we'll go through this. I'm hoping the presentation will be about an hour long, leaving plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, and then in, I'll be doing the major presentation and then Jeff will be monitoring the chat, helping to answer questions, providing resources and stuff like that as well. Um, so we'll jump right in. Um, as Shelley mentioned, we are Bayview Analytics. Um, I'm the director of research at Bayview and then Jeff who's in the chat uh, is also a director here. Uh, we are formerly known as Babson Survey Research Group. Um, so if you're familiar with some of our older reports, they would have been under that name. And we really are um, a consulting group, but we foc focus on and specialize in education research. Um, and we've been doing this for about uh, two decades. So specifically for this talk, we're going to be uh, reviewing the report that just came out in June, uh, which are our results of the 2021-2022 school year for the Higher Education Survey on OER. Um, this survey was conducted in April to higher education faculty and administrators. We had about just under 3,000 total respondents. Um, and then that those respondents came from all 50 states and DC. Um, and our survey included both returning questions as well as brand new questions for this year. Um, and in this presentation, uh, which will be very new um, and never before published, are we had an additional 82 faculty from California that we included and now are able to use these faculty responses as um, a way to look at the different regions and specifically calling out California versus other regions. So a little background for these surveys. We've been doing um, the OER surveys in higher education since 2009. Um, and we've had over 26,000 respondents over all of our surveys. And as I mentioned, I'll be talking about our 2021-2022 survey, which we published in June. Um, and of course, nothing in the last few years can be uh, published to talk about without mentioning, of course, COVID-19. Um, and so we do have two of our reports, this one and our previous one, which do include a lot of information on the impact of COVID-19 and the pandemic in higher education. And this, uh, report is also the first in a series of three. So we have two more years already scheduled to go out. 
Um, so we are planning to have a report in next year and 2024, and hopefully for more years after that. Um, and so our reports um, are part of the larger project and the goals of the survey are really to understand the role of OER in higher education and to quantify perceptions and awareness of OER. Um, as I mentioned, our respondents are higher education administrators, faculty, chief academic officers, and we always aim every year to have a nationally representative uh, pool of respondents for both geography and type of institution. And um, I would be remiss to not mention that how happy we are um, to have the support from the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, as well as our other partners, including OLC, Pearson, Alfred P. Sloan, and Kaplan. Um, and so they have been with us throughout um, the multiple decades now of this project and um, have really helped us grow and move forward. Uh, so a little bit of the nitty gritty before we get in, um, and this is just so everyone's on the same page. We have been using um, a very similar questions and even identical questions over the years, and I'll be showing some of the time series for that. And so those, the ability to include question year over year gives us um, the ability to analyze in the time series and see trends that happen. Um, but one important thing is that we're using the same questions and definitions. So I've listed the definitions here that will become um, important through our talk. And so just for people who are interested, OER um, definition uh, is actually pulled from what the Hewlett Foundation uses um, primarily uh, for their work. And then uh, we also define and use two licensing um, definitions in our survey as well um, that are public domain and creative commons. And so uh, a little background before we jump into all the data um, is that this survey results will be talking about different regions. These are regions based off of the um, census board um, with the exception that I have pulled out California from the Western region. So we'll be comparing five different regions, California, uh, the West, Midwest, South, and Northeast, as well as um, what I'll call the total or national level, um, which is all of the data combined. And so this is just to set you up so you know what states are referred to. All right, um, so jumping into this talk, um, I'll be going through the topics, and these are um, basically the same topics that are in a report. Um, however, I'll be including more data, especially about the regions that were not actually published in our report. Um, and so as I go through this, uh, please uh, let us know if anything is surprising or interesting to you in the chat. Um, we're really interested in knowing any of the feedback or questions that come as we present. Um, what it, and we also wanna know, since as I mentioned, we're going to do this for at least two more years and hopefully more after, we wanna know what is the most useful information for you and what else do you wanna know? Because we are able to change the survey questions coming up, we are able to adapt our project. So if uh, we wanna know what will make the biggest impact to the people who are actually using OER and trying to uh, push the initiatives forward. All right, um, so as we jump in, uh, I've broken it down into a few different sections based off of the general questions that we're trying to answer. And so the major question when we start was really what did higher education look like in 2021 to 2022? And then, how much has the pandemic continued to impact classes? We know from our prior year's report that the pandemic had a major impact, and I'm sure everyone here is fully aware of that as well, but we wanted to actually have a quantitative measure of what this sort of more long-term impact is. And then we also want to know how do faculty want to teach? Um, are they really, how are they coming out of the pandemic experience and what do they want? So jumping in, um, we really want to see the backdrop for uh, the education in 2021 to 2022. And so to do this, we asked faculty to rate um, how their opinion changed on a bunch of different topics, and those are shown on the right. And so in blue are opinions that improved, red is no change, and then purple are decreased. And so overall, we did see that there were improvements in opinion on digital materials, and so those are the top two, um, acceptance of digital materials and opinion online learning. The majority of faculty said their opinion and experience teaching has improved. Um, we did see that faculty are um, responding that there's a worsened experience for students. 
and so that's just student um, faculty communication collaboration among students um, have that large purple bars it's saying that those have uh, decreased in the experience and then what was interesting is that we actually saw there was no major differences across the regions for these so this is a very national um, sort of experience across the board for faculty and so with this um, as the backdrop for going in uh, we went into a little more detail, um, specifically learn, looking at how faculty were teaching. Um, and so we wanted to know if they were teaching um, modality. So were they face-to-face -face in the classroom 100%? Were they 100% online? Or was it somewhere in between in that um, blended or combination course? And so what we saw um, on the left is this time series. So uh, we're using the year before the pandemic, the 2018 to 2019 school year, where 96% of faculty reported they taught at least one course um, that was face-to-face. -face. And then, uh, so faculty, just so you're aware, faculty were, were able to select any that applied. So they, that's why the numbers uh, don't add to 100, but 96% of faculty who responded said that they were teaching a course face-to-face. -face, and about a third said they were teaching courses that were blended or online. Um, and then when the pandemic started, the red bars, you see that massive shift away from face-to-face -face and to that online. So face-to-face -face dropped to only 14% of faculty um, for the 2019-2020 school year. And then 71% of them said they were teaching online. And so when we asked it for in the spring 2022, we can see that there was a shift back to face-to-face, -to -face, but nowhere near to the levels that it was pre-pandemic. So it really became a split where faculty were saying there's about half of them, a little over half were saying they're teaching face-to-face -face, and just under half were saying they're teaching online. And so it's a really interesting where um, the getting from pre-pandemic, we're not there yet um, out of coming out of the pandemic. And so the graph on the right is showing um, these values uh, with the different regions shown. And so what is interesting is that um, when we look at the California and then also the Western regions, those are more likely to sh be in fully online courses than they were to be in face-to-face -face courses. And so this is pretty interesting and I'm sure there are many uh, opinions as to why this may be, but uh, two of the major ones that we believe are that before the pandemic even started, that the West and California may have already had um, online courses rates and face-to-face -face rates be higher. Um, this is something we can't um, explicitly look into our data, but it's a hypothesis for us. And then another thing that many of us are aware of in California is that there's been stronger and longer COVID measures that have forced classrooms online, um, whether they wanted to be or not. Um, and so that's a major difference between some of these regions as well. Um, so moving forward, uh, we also, as I mentioned, wanted to know what teachers and faculty wanted to do. And so we, we actually asked them if they want to teach courses as a combination or blended, as well as if they want to teach their courses in a fully online format. And so we do see, um, and if you look at the uh, numbers, the blue and red are the strongly agree. So just over half of all faculty nationally said that they would agree that they want to teach courses as a combination. And a similar level um, said that they do want to teach um, fully online as well. And California um, was actually a little stronger on those online courses. Um, so we also um, were fortunate enough that many of the faculty in our surveys have um, actually provided a lot of opinions and comments to us. And so um, for faculty that have agreed to share, I've included some of them here. And these are um, just sort of anecdotal, but also um, very similar to the larger themes that we saw in the comments. And so uh, some administrators were mentioning that um, the shift to online was really dependent on those who had uh, basically online tools already um, in their classroom. So faculty who had a variety of features in the LMS were better positioned for the pandemic. And then faculty were also uh, remarking on 
sort of the change in their role when they shift to online. And so one faculty member, and this is a, uh, opinion we've heard before is that online classes turn faculty into content providers. They don't, some faculty no longer feel like teachers. They don't, they just feel like they're providing another show or something for the students to look at. And then the other faculty, and this is something that uh, we've actually measured and are trying to quantify in our data, is that the pandemic forced a change to digital learning um, at a very quick time. And this was a trend we'd see ongoing, but the pandemic basically shortened that time frame up a lot. And so the change to get a lot of faculty and holdouts um, for digital learning uh, was removed because the pandemic forced the issue. All right, um, so, so the setting the scene for the backdrop and the pandemic, knowing that many courses are still um, online or combination, not everyone's back to face-to-face. -to -face. We want to also look at to what materials are actually being used in these cor courses. And that's looking really around textbooks and how much of these materials are accessed digitally. So going forward, we're asking faculty to rate um, what materials are required or recommended when they think about their largest enrollment course. And so um, as a little bit of background, the largest enrollment courses, I'm sure many of you know, are um, the courses that tend to be the introductory or lower level courses. Um, and so that just sort of helps us get a little bit more comparable um, between the faculty answers rather than everyone talking about a specialized course. So when faculty were um, talking about their largest enrollment courses, um, the single course, we see that online homework systems are the most commonly required um, materials that are used. And then um, as well as article and case studies, digital or print textbooks were only required about 50% of the time. Though if you see if uh, combine them, you can see that 60% of the time uh, faculty required a, a textbook of either format. Um, and then video, software, and other supplies were required by a minority of participants. But it's quite interesting that um, there's only about up to 70% of faculty require um, at most these digital tools uh, for any given tool. And then when we compare to California, um, so this is another way that I'll be showing the comparisons. And this is a, basically showing the difference to the national. So the way to read this, is that um, California for print textbooks required was 0.3% less than that national, which is shown here. So for print textbooks required is 44% for the national on the chart. And then in the table, it's 0.3% negative, um, so less than that. Um, so when we look at the difference between California and national, uh, we see that California uh, faculty were much more likely to require these digital tools um, and the tools they were much more likely and actually statistically significantly more likely to require were video and film um, by more than 7% over the national um, amount and then digital textbooks as well. And California and also the West um, region lead um, vastly this digital textbook required. And so um, when we're actually looking at the textbooks, we acknowledge that there's uh, many different ways for textbooks to become available to students. And so just saying print or digital may not actually be the full story. So we actually looked into how textbooks became available and were made available to the faculty and faculty were able um, to answer for um, select all that applied for them. And again, this is only uh, looking at the faculty's largest enrollment course. And we only ask this question for faculty where textbooks were required. And so um, the vast majority of textbooks, as you might sort of assume, um, were the new print versions available for sale and then the used print versions. However, um, digital versions available for sale were very much up there. Um, one thing that we wanted to note is that um, textbooks that were available for reduced fees or co uh, low cost, no cost, uh, we're very much a minority. Um, and also noting that things, um, especially for print versions at low cost, um, so like the print versions available on reserve, we want to note that those might not be enough for the entire class as well. 
Um, however, uh, when we compare between faculty and sort of look at how many different formats were available, 66% of the faculty reported that their textbooks are available in more than one format. So they are making options um, available to students. So there are a few different ways for um, students to access textbooks. And when we compare California to the national, um, we do see that the mass uh, difference is really on that digital and especially the digital version available without cost. California was nine percentage points higher than the national average, um, which was 17 percent. But I'll note that that still makes it only a quarter of all faculty in California saying that this was available, even though it was the best rate for anywhere, any region of the country. All right. Um, we also wanted to know um, from faculty and administrators their opinions on digital versus print, because uh, we acknowledge that the what the tools and the formats of faculty use may not always match up with what they want to use. Um, and so the uh, question we asked is, do they agree with the statement, students learn better from print materials than they do digital? And so this is saying the faculty who agree are ones who lean more towards physical materials. And as we see this over time um, has decreased. And so we do see that this um, sort of leads with the general idea that faculty are becoming more accepting of digital materials. Um, this doesn't mean they're necessarily preferring them. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit better, but um, this is also showing the pandemic effect because we know that uh, pre-pandemic, many of the faculty had not taught online courses or were not primarily teaching online courses and may not have experienced a lot of the digital materials. Um, and then mid-pandemic, uh, um, there wasn't much of a shift, uh, though it was slight change from strongly agree, preferring print to just agreeing. Um, and this may be due also to the fact that a lot of these shifts were emergency, a lot of stuff is going on, maybe not a lot of time to appreciate um, all the options digital materials had, um, because when we finally looked um, at our survey this year, we see that there was actually a pretty big drop. Um, we also want to know a little bit about the other options um, and so the features of digital materials. So we asked if digital materials provide greater flexibility for students. Um, and we asked this both to administrators and faculty. And we see that the vast majority, over 70% of both groups, do agree that digital materials are more flexible. Um, and so this is uh, sort of a stronger trend that there's really growing acceptance of digital as learning materials in the classroom for higher education. Um, and so we also wanted to know really where faculty placed themselves. And so we had faculty self rate themselves on a scale of zero to 100 um, with zero being I prefer print, so 100% I prefer print, and then 100 being 100% I prefer digital materials for my courses. Um, and so what you can see here is it's basically a very even division between all the different um, 10 groups of this continuum. And so this actually was probably one of our most interesting results that there is no clear pattern across all faculty. Um, there really is an equal proportion of faculty who want all print as they are all digital or just a little print versus a little digital or so it's really a balanced look in the faculty group. Um, and this is really just showing faculty preferences are very divor diverse. And so if you choose two different faculty and give them the same course materials, one may completely love it because it's all print and the other may completely criticize it because it's all print. Um, and I think this also sort of helps show why there are so many options still available in um, the marketplace for textbooks and textbook types and course materials as well. Um, and this is something that we'll be following and seeing if there is a trend um, towards digital as that becomes more popular. Um, and so we also want to look, um, and this is looking at that continuum, um, and comparing to some of the different features of faculty to their ratings. And so what was interesting, um, though maybe not surprising, is that there is actually a preference for digital 
um, if the faculty is teaching in an online course. And so faculty who are fully face-to-face -face gave an average rating on the continuum of 50, which means that they were equally balanced between print and digital. Faculty that were in combination or faculty that were teaching fully online courses actually did lean towards digital materials. And so if we break that down by region as well, we see in California, um, all faculty there, regardless of what type of course they teach, um, though remember many of them were still teaching slightly more online courses than um, nationally, uh, do lean towards digital materials. All right. Um, another thing we wanted to know, and I think this won't be surprising to anyone, especially people um, working in OER, um, is looking at how much faculty agree with the statement, the cost of course materials is a serious problem for my students. And so here, the over 60% of faculty strongly agree. Um, and this was, oh, sorry, over 60% of faculty strongly agree or agree. And this was consistent across the region. There were no differences. Um, and only uh, less than 20% disagree that the cost of course material is a serious problem. Um, and so for some of those people who disagree, those might be people who have already potentially switched to OER or low cost materials. So they don't believe that it's a problem anymore as well. Um, but this is really interesting because this is something that was a very strong problem in many of our earlier surveys. Um, and so we wanted to come back and check if it was something that was still of a problem and of top of mind for faculty. And it definitely is, and it will be something that we follow a bit more um, as we move into the more digital textbooks and see how those are able to combat rising student costs. Um, so finally, um, some of the faculty um, perspectives on this uh, and the switch to digital and um, pandemic teaching. And so um, very interesting that some faculty we're very clear that the switch to digital and online teaching uh, was really dependent on access. And so this faculty has mentioned that they're very rural and high poverty. So access to internet at home is a real barrier. Um, so therefore they preferred um, print materials. Whereas another one was stating that uh, the student generation right now are so tied to phones and digital that not using digital ma material is a disservice to them. Um, and that faculty need to keep up with what the students are doing rather than having the students come to them. All right, so I just sort of went through over what materials were actually used in the classroom. So now we're, we want to know how good are those materials? How much do the faculty actually like them? What factors impact the faculty ratings and materials? And does the publisher who is providing the materials actually impact their curricula of rating as well. So for this, we asked the faculty to do a curricular satisfaction rating uh, on a scale of zero to 100, with 100 being the best or most satisfied. Um, and so we did this on five different features, um, four features of the curriculum, and then had them give an overall score of their level of satisfaction. And so for the different features of the curriculum, you can see that the accuracy and scope of coverage were very high ratings. Those were um, very high in the 80s for the average rating. Very, um, almost all faculty were happy with accuracy and scope of the curriculum materials they were using. Um, there were lower ratings specifically to the cost of student. And um, the lowest rating was the included supplemental instructor materials as well. Um, and this overall gives, um, the overall level of satisfaction was between those two groups. Um, and so you could see, um, and that is shown in that sort of gold yellow bar. So we wanted to break down a little further and see what factors um, really impact these things. And so one of the major ones was what material are they using? And one way we can get at that is who's providing it. And so we asked faculty to rate their course curriculum. And then we took the overall rating that they gave and broke it down by what publisher. And so uh, we compared the OER, if they were using an OER publisher um, co or a commercial publisher. And within the commercial publishers, we distinguish between what we call the big three, which is Cengage, McGraw-Hill, and Pearson, who make up of about 40 per 50% of the whole um, marketplace versus the almost 200 plus other commercial publishers that make up the rest of the marketplace. 
And so if we look at the average rating, we see that faculty who use OER publishers give it the highest rating, as well as um, very similar as well to the other commercial publishers. And the big three um, commercial publisher rating was the lowest. And so what's interesting is that this trend has been um, the same for many years now in our um, report where faculty who use OER publishers give the same or now actually most recently in the last few reports even higher ratings than they do to faculty who use um, commercial publishers. And so if we break this down, um, there's actually some interesting trends by region. Um, and I included the national or total scores um, again on the right here. And so you can see for California, um, California gives OER curriculum the highest rating out of any region. So it has the highest red bar with an 86. Um, and it actually rates um, all its curriculum at slightly higher or high levels, um, but the OER curriculum was rated the highest. And then uh, what's interesting as well is OER curriculum, no matter what region, is higher than the big three. Um, however, some uh, regions do like um, other commercial curriculums and give those ratings higher than they would for OER. All right, um, so that brings us to, we um, gave you a little, few little hints about OER doing better in the curricular average. So we really want to look into what is the current status for OER. And this is really sort of our um, anchor for all of our surveys that we've been doing um, in this series. And so the question that we came to at the beginning for the survey is really, do faculty know what OER is and how is OER used in courses? And so these are the questions that we have been asking for now about 10 years um, of the same questions so we can do the time series. And it's really been interesting as well to add in the additional impact of the pandemic and see how that may have impacted things. And so here um, we have a question in our survey, which is, are you aware of OER? And we give them the definition that I shared early in this talk. And so we ask them to rate their awareness level on these five different um, settings, which is very aware, aware, somewhat aware, um, heard of, or not aware. And so we do give these different um, gradients of answers as a way for people, because many people may have think, oh, that term's familiar or something. So I may be, we don't want someone who has just heard of, but don't know about it to say that they are actually aware because we were trying to get into people who are aware and know what they do and can talk about it. Um, and so here we see with this question, 67% of faculty and so have some level of awareness of OER. And so this is um, the combination of very aware, aware, and somewhat aware um, with 52% um, saying, so just over half of faculty are saying that they are very aware or, or aware of OER. Um, and then 15% of faculty said that they were not aware of OER. And so um, if you're familiar with our report, um, you, under, you might have known that we don't actually use this um, straight question of OER awareness as our actual measure of um, OER awareness for faculty. And so this is because um, we have found that with this single question, we can't exactly trust these answers. And that's due to um, how faculty interpret OER, um, open educational resources, as well as some of the definitions there. And so we have found that faculty um, who are aware of OER may be confusing it with free online materials, not necessarily OER specifically materials, and may confuse it with any open source materials. Um, and so we have found that this question alone is a bit imprecise. And so what we have done um, for our reports is an improved measurement um, or strict measurement of OER awareness. And this requires a combination of faculty stating that they are aware of OER, as well as aware of Creative Commons as a licensing um, type. And so um, respondents uh, who report that they were unaware of Creative Commons licensing are removed from these awareness um, categories. So we can basically get a much stricter level. And so um, to do that, we obviously had to ask um, faculty if they were aware of these licensing. And so we asked faculty to their awareness levels on Creative Commons, copyright, and public domain. 
And so what is really interesting is um, very high levels in higher ed for awareness of these uh, three different licensings. Um, and it leads higher than we see when we um, survey uh, K-12 teachers. And so copyright and public domain almost have universal awareness um, with uh, over 90% being aware at some level. Creative Commons um, is slightly lower, um, so under 80%, but still very high with over 50% saying they are very aware or aware. Um, and so these are very strong and high levels um, that we see. Um, and then when we uh, combine it to create our strict awareness, um, we can see that the level of awareness for people who are very aware and aware, um, which was 52%, now drops down to 46. And the total awareness, so very aware, aware, and some of somewhat aware, which was 67, now drops down to 57. So we do lose some people in these groups, um, but we do feel that this is a much better and rigorous measurement of OER awareness. Um, and so uh, we do see that still over 50% of faculty are aware of OER with this strict definition. And if we compare it by regions, um, we see that the awareness level in California and the West are higher than the national averages. Um, with interesting, the uh, Northeast actually has the lowest awareness of OER. Um, and what was great to see for California is it has the highest level of faculty saying that they are very aware with almost 30%. And so, um, as I mentioned, we've been asking this question as sort of the anchor of our surveys. And so we have um, year over year data going back to 2014, 2015 school year. And um, what has been great to see for us is that the OER awareness uh, level has grown. Um, and as I mentioned, it's now over 50% for the first time. Um, the last time we um, assessed it in the 2019-2020 school year, it had just hit 50%. Um, and so we had a awareness growth of over of 7% um, since our last survey, and then almost doubled um, since the earliest time period when we uh, had uh, started surveying faculty. Um, and so what has also been great here to see is that the level of growth um, really comes in both in the total number of people, so how large the bars are um, combined. So you can see that go down um, on the diagonal as it grows, but also in the number of faculty who are becoming very aware. So that blue bar year over year is growing, um, which says that people, not just our faculty becoming aware, but they're also actually becoming more confident in their awareness of OBR as every year goes through. All right. Um, and as you may wonder, uh, we did look at how faculty, uh, the publishers that faculty use affect OER awareness. Um, not surprisingly, faculty who use OER publishers are the most aware of um, OER um, using our strict definition. And so here, 65% uh, of faculty who use an OER publisher state that they are very aware with additional 16% stating that they are aware. Uh, what is interesting is that one in 20 users of OER um, are not aware. Um, so, uh, sorry, 20% of users are, of OER are not aware that they are using it. Um, and then not surprisingly, faculty who are um, not using OER publishers are less aware and actually closer to those national levels that we saw. And so uh, what was also interesting is we looked for the OER awareness uh, for faculty who use OER publishers by region. Um, and you can see the same graph um, for the total or national shown on the top. And then California by far has the highest awareness of OER users that they are using OER. Um, or that they know what OER is. Um, so it's quite, um, that's one of the places where it does seem California has done a good job about teaching people, at least people who have picked up OER, that they are what OER is and the benefits potentially of it. Um, and so we also wanna know specifically does OER awareness and OER use? Um, that we understand they are not the same thing. People can be aware of something without actually implementing it. 
Um, so we did ask faculty, do they require or have OER materials as supplemental course materials? And so you can see 40% of faculty in our survey have stated that they do have um, OER as a required or supplemental material uh, with 8% actually using it for both. Um, and so this gives a total of 22% of faculty uh, saying that they do have OER as a required material. And so if we look at this trend year over year, um, we see starting back in 2015, 2016 school year, only 5% of faculty had OER as a required material. So that is almost basically quadrupled um, to the last school year. So OER use is also increasing, um, but this 22%, um, if I go back uh, to uh, OER awareness, is basically equivalent to just those who are very aware, this 23% of OER. So the use of OER, um, the 22% as uh, required or 40%, as required or supplemental is still below the total um, awareness of faculty. Um, and so OER use by region um, showing here, um, you can see California has the highest amount, though there isn't much difference between the regions as well. Um, and so I also wanted to look to see if OER was a required textbook um, because OER does include a lot of, not just textbooks, but other parts of the course material. Um, and so, and it can also be used as a supplemental textbook too. Um, and so what we looked at um, was the total textbooks. And so this is sort of equivalent to market share. And so um, for the overall national average, OER made up 10%, OER textbooks um, made up 10% of all of the required textbooks required by faculty. Um, and then that grew to 16% within California. So California actually was sort of driving that because um, you can see the other regions were much lower um, than the national average. And so uh, California has the highest proportion of OER required textbooks. Um, as you can see, as I mentioned, those big three, which is uh, Sengage, Pearson, and McGraw-Hill uh, makes up roughly 40% of all required textbooks by the faculty with the other 50% of the faculty requiring other commercial textbooks. Um, and so 100 plus, closer to 200 total um, commercial publishers are in that purple group. Um, for the OER publishers, uh, OpenStax is by far the biggest that we've seen. Um, and I'll do a little more details here. Um, so we looked in to this group of those 10% nationally or the 16% within California who are requiring textbooks, we want to know what OER textbooks and what publishers were they using? Um, and so this is self-reported data uh, with a little bit of cleaning because sometimes uh, they would mention something but we could match it to a specific uh, publisher. And so what we see is that um, OpenStax is by far the most common publisher. And so the way to read it, um, this chart is if you look at this California column, uh, it will add up to 100%. And so this is showing the proportion, if I go back to the prior slide, of that 16% who require OER textbooks. So 36% of faculty in California who require OER textbooks are using OpenStax textbooks. Um, and that is pretty consistent nationally and to different regions. Though interestingly, um, the West, which is basically west of the Rockies, except California, um, are huge groups and huge users of OpenStax textbooks. Um, OpenStax itself is the fourth most common uh, publisher overall. So it goes the big three, um, Cengage, McGraw, Pearson, and then OpenStax. Um, so OpenStax does have a actual considerable market share within higher ed publishers itself. Other most commonly used um, publishers are OER Commons, Open Textbooks Library, um, and then um, sort of other types moved in. Um, and we're showing some of the use of the other bigger names that people may be familiar with. Um, and so uh, the other thing we want to note is other does include uh, faculty who stated that they were self-published or department published textbooks. 
All right. Um, another thing regarding OER, as, we, as many people know, um, OER initiatives are a big reason why OER awareness can grow or use can pick up. Um, so we asked the faculty to state if they are aware of any OER initiatives from their department, institution, or system-wide. Um, and so you can see that a vast majority of OER uh, of faculty are unaware, so 66%, with only 27% stating that they're actually aware. Um, however, that number is much higher when we look at the regions for California with 35, over a third of faculty saying that they're aware of an open ed resource initiative um, within California. So a few of the perspectives we see. Um, so one faculty, uh, I basically pulled out a faculty who really was positive and then also another quote that was pretty negative. Um, and so for OER, the faculty really liked it um, because of the ability to customize, the ability to keep courses fresh in engagement and to ensure that the courses and student courses are, um, materials are free to the students. And so the other faculty, which mentioned that they were really impressed with um, some of the commercial publishers adaptive learning components and seeing significant improvements using that. So they would prefer to use uh, those methods which seem more effective to them than an OER option um, at the expense of the student learning. All right, um, so now I'm getting into a section uh, that should have new for us and we haven't published it before, but it's really interesting to go through. And really what we want to look at is what do all these data mean for OER? Does, it, does OER awareness and use overlap? Do OER initiatives have an impact on awareness or use? Um, and so I just wanna say uh, flat out, uh, we can't necessarily measure a direct impact of any of these together, but what we can do is see how well they overlap, what might be correlated, Again, that's not um, causation, uh, but we're just seeing how our data suggests these different groups overlap. Um, so I'll be walking you through this and there'll be a couple um, graphs and takes away, but really what this analysis is doing is putting together the three measures of OER that we have in our survey. And so that is OER awareness, initiative awareness, and OER use. And so for OER awareness, um, I broke it down into either they were aware, so very aware, aware, somewhat aware, versus not aware of OER, initially very similar, um, and use of OER, um, and these were use of OER as a required or supplemental material, so that total 40% group rather than the smaller 22% who just required it. And so when you have these three measures, and each measure has um, either a yes or no, that actually creates eight different groups. And so that's what I'm showing here, um, where you can have basically a yes no in any of those three columns and so at the very top are faculty who are not aware of oer not aware of initiative and don't use it and at the very bottom we see faculty who are aware of oer aware of initiatives and do use oer and so putting this together um, we have these eight different groups and so going uh, from left to right are those who are um, it's the same as the top to bottom of that chart so it was not aware of OER, not aware of initiatives and don't use. And then to the other side are those who are very aware and do use. And so um, showing that here in the bars underneath. And so I'll be using these bars sort of as um, keys for this. And so um, the black or bars represent those who are not aware or don't use, with the red saying that those are used or aware. Um, and you, you can sort of, if you look down, like you choose that red bar, you can see the red bar is are people who don't use OER. And if you go down, they are not aware of initiatives, but they are aware of OER. So moving that up um, and keeping those there for a key, we'll call out a few of the interesting data that come out. And um, these slides are also available in the files for download. Uh, so it'll be, if you wanna take a little more time to digest this, because I know this can be quite confusing. Um, but going forward, uh, this blue group is the group of faculty who are don't use, are not aware of initiatives and not aware of OER itself. And so this 20% of faculty still need to learn about OER or an initiative. They are sort of this unexposed, completely OER naive group. And then we also see that this is 3% of faculty who actually use OER, 
but stated that they were unaware of it. So there is some confusion still um, within here. And this is interesting because they we did specifically ask them if they use OER as a material and they said yes, but then they said they were unaware of it as well. Um, so there is still confusion around OER um, for those who use it and also for many who don't use it yet. Um, so if we look at the total group, 72% um, of faculty are aware of OER or initiatives or both. Um, so it's a big majority of groups um, has some exposure to OER and that's in contrast to that 28% who are the OER naive group. So uh, when we're looking in the 72% who are aware, 57% are OER users. Um, and so this is an increase of 40% for everyone. So people who are aware of OER initiatives do tend to be more likely to be OER users. So there does seem to be a positive impact of awareness, which is what you might expect if people, um, when you become aware of something, it becomes an option for the faculty to use. And so looking um, for self-awareness of the 67% aware of OER, over half of unaware of initiatives. And so this may mean that they found OER themselves, they found OER through a reference, they just happened to use a, a material and realized it was OER. Um, so these are people who are becoming aware of OER sort of on their own, um, potentially. And then looking at those um, who are aware of initiatives, only 4% of faculty aware of initiatives. Um, so that the combination of this purple group and that dark blue um, bar that you may not be able to see very well. Um, so the, the faculty who are aware of initiatives um, are almost universally aware of OER as well. Um, so only 4% of faculty who said, oh yeah, there's something about an OER on my campus, but I don't actually know what OER is. So initiatives do seem to work to spread awareness um, in our data set or suggest that they do. I can't say that it proves it. Um, we also see, uh, looking at this a little differently, that OER may help with use. 64% um, of faculty aware of initiatives are OER users, um, which is much higher than the general population. So uh, it seems that initiatives from our data set seem to su suggest that faculty are more likely to become aware of OER and people who are aware of OER are more likely to use it. Um, so awareness is still a key um, hurdle for getting um, to OER users. And o initiatives are a potential way to overcome that. All right, um, so jumping into sort of results summary um, and then opening it up for questions and anything later. Um, so the results um, on the left are the major results um, from the report nationally. Um, and these are coming from our actual publication as well. And so what we did see is that students are returning to classroom, but there's not been a return to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, faculty and administrators have expressed a growing acceptance and even preference for online or blended learning environments. Um, remember over 50% said they would agree that they do want to teach blended or online, um, as well as digital courseware with a lot of faculty stating their preference for digital or stating that um, they do prefer students or themselves do prefer digital. Uh, we did find again that this year cost to students is a major concern. Uh, though noting that required textbooks are most commonly available as physical um, rather than digital. And both of those most commonly are available for a fee. Uh, free options do exist though often in limited numbers. Uh, and again, noting that 86% of administrators, um, which is, was a data set I didn't show, but administrators are slightly more concerned with cost to students than the fac individual faculty themselves. Um, so 86% of administrators and 64% of faculty agree that cost of course materials is a serious problem. Um, and then moving specifically, the acceptance of digital course materials has grown along with the awareness and unit use of open educational resources. Um, and so this is reviewing the last few slides that I did, but really, pretty um, remarkable for us that the OER awareness using our strict definition was over 50% to 57% in the survey that we measured. Um, so what we also wanted to show out and um, for the analysis that we did by region is that we see that California has a very 
interesting differences um, from the rest of the country, though overall is very similar um, nationally. Um, so I would say like 90% of the measures, the region that the faculty teaches in don't really matter, but there are some very key me uh, measures of California um, and often the West as well uh, differed. And so in California, the courses were more likely to be online and use digital textbooks. However, again, the use of digital textbooks while much higher in California was still a minority of faculty requiring it for that largest enrollment course. Uh, Cal California faculty also report to using video and film more, um, but they don't have many other differences for the other materials that are commonly used like online homework things. Um, there are minimal differences on the overall preferences for print or digital as learning tools for students, but um, there is a big difference for California faculty on their self rating for a preference on the print to digital continuum. So this seems to suggest that faculty, California faculty are a little bit more accepting themselves and prefer themselves on digital materials. But when it comes to teaching in a classroom, they aren't that much different than the national um, sentiments that we found. Um, and what is really interesting for us, and I'm sure for many in the audience, is that California uses more OER and has higher level of OER and OER initiative awareness. Um, and what we saw in the last sort of data that I showed is that um, OER awareness and initiative awareness can lead or suggest that um, it can lead to increases in OER use. And so um, as our final slide, what does this mean for OER? Um, there's been some great positive news for OER. Um, OER awareness and growth continues to go up, um, but that does leave the question, how much longer can it go? Um, how much uh, is there a ceiling for this, um, especially for use? Um, it's some good news that growing faculty acceptance of digital materials. Um, and OER continues to have the highest curriculum rating of all publishers, um, which does seem to suggest that people who do use it do seem to like it. Um, some of the bad news, uh, the return to face-to-face -face reduces the need um, for digital curriculum, uh, doesn't necessarily get rid of it, but no longer makes it always a necessity um, as the print options and physical options come back into uh, being available for use. Um, and I didn't exactly cover a lot of this, but I'm sure many people are aware of the increasing competition for OER. Um, commercial publishers have vastly shifted their options, especially um, following the pandemic to offering digital curriculum. As I mentioned, one of the perspectives did include something about the adaptive learning and a lot of the online homework um, systems and LMS systems are being pushed into fully integrated into commercial publisher office offerings. And then also not included in this talk, but um, is reported in the uh, PDF of our report is that there is increasing use and awareness of inclusive access and that um, awareness of inclusive access from the commercial publishers is actually growing, has grown at a higher rate and much quicker than we saw for OER awareness. Um, and so a big thing and questions for OER is really what we're calling that OER gap. Um, we're not all OER users are aware of OER, not all people who are aware actually use OER and that the awareness and, and initiatives of OER varies a lot. Um, probably within communities, but we saw it um, varies by region. So there is no sort of national push um, or universal effort, as I'm sure many people know, and I've heard earlier in talks between even just the um, California colleges and universities. Um, so with that, I um, wanna say we'll move to the question and answer and definitely thank you. Um, the full reports, uh, I think Jeff has left um, some of the links in the, uh, chat as well, um, but they're available on our website. Uh, we do release notes um, when we publish anything or have other presentations um, through our LinkedIn group. You can search my name or Bayview, as well as we do have a Twitter for the company. Um, and then always please do reach out to us um, if you have any questions on our report or if you have any ideas for new projects. Um, we're open to doing new projects. We're happy to um, sort of help um, with any grant applications or um, both with providing data from our OER reports as well as um, either for new projects, potentially providing some of the survey services as well. Um, so yeah, please let us know if there's any questions or anything and we'll go um, and happy to answer them. 
thank you, Julia, for a fantastic presentation. Lots and lots of data <laughs> to yes. chew on and think about. I'll let uh, Jeff uh, direct the questions to you because I know he's been monitoring the chat. Um, first, just to, to mention for those who might not have seen the chat, the, there was one error in slide 12, which we corrected, and so there's a link to the corrected one. Uh, we'll update the slide deck to represent that, um, so you'll get the corrected one. And another note, just the path of bold automatic links truncates, and so it doesn't always work, so you need to actually cut and paste the link in your browser to make it work. Um, I would uh, just then, uh, forward to Julia, the, the one, one issue that people have been talking about in the chat is the idea that faculty are often, one is just confusion about licensing um, and that that runs as a continuous problem through all of this, um, but also confusion about what is a publisher. Um, that the same material could be in an OER distribution site direct from the OER publisher or available in seven other places. And faculty can be often just saying where they got it, not who made it. Um, we've seen this through a lot of our work for these issues. One of the, uh, the good news is um, it's a problem, but the problem is considerably smaller than it was in 2009 on our first survey, where it was, almost impossible to get faculty to tell us if they were using OER um, because they did not understand at all of that. And they, so the level of knowledge and, um, and I will be the first to admit that self-reported knowledge on are you aware of something always tends to bias high. People do not like to say that what they don't know, um, but it's the same bias over time. So we're pleased to see that the level of knowledge, self-professed knowledge of licensing has continued to go up through all of our service. So from 2009 through now, the level of licensing awareness is much, much higher than it was at that point. The level of awareness about OER is much, much higher. And the level of confusion is still there um, and has not gone away but it is probably diminished to about 25% of the level of confusion we saw early on. So it remains a long, uh, a long struggle to get all of the, the clarity about all of this correct uh, and to have. So what I will tell you is in all of these awareness questions and that consider them with a reasonable error bar around them. But on the other hand, the error bar, if anything, gets smaller over time and is consistent. So the trends you can believe, do you want to believe it's exactly 28% and not 29? I would tell you, don't worry about that. Um, but that's one of the issues we've seen here. Um, I'm trying to think what else we would want to. Um, so pause for a second. Uh, Julia, anything you wanted to add for where we are right now on any of those issues? Um, I think mostly, again, the reporting of publishers is uh, fraught with error. Um, many faculty don't know. Um, additionally, many faculty may have, and publishers may have specific names at specific institutions. Um, so we do do some um, curating of the answers. So the results aren't the raw results, we do go through and we'll match them um, to what is known. Um, so that does increase some of our confidence in it. Um, I would say the biggest thing for OER specifically is um, the huge impact that OpenStax has made. Um, and I would say many users of OpenStax no longer consider it or really acknowledge it or know about it as OER, they just, came about it because it was a textbook option. Um, so that's where we're sort of going and seeing um, the potential for the gap that I talked about for people who use OER versus people who know what OER actually is um, could actually widen 
as um, publishers like OpenStax become to become to seem more like just a normal publisher option that just happens to be pretty cheap and have some cool abilities to edit the text. Um, so it will be interesting to measure how the gaps and potential errors in those data sets um, change over time uh, with the trends in the publishing world and use. And I would second the, the finding about the OpenStax, which is we have moved from a point where um, we've asked many questions about how do you uh, faculty members to determine. So we've um, got lists of 600 different uh, books and publishers and asked faculty by discipline which ones they were using, which ones they had um, evaluated, and, and looking for things that were OER based was virtually impossible until OpenStax had a large enough presence that they have a name recognition and a quality recognition that we've not seen prior. Um, and so as some of you have seen in our work is that, um, that we there's a lot of data in here and also in the K-12 reports showing that the argument is not of the same quality is just not there. That the faculty using OER materials rate them generally the, as good as or better, more often slightly better than commercial options. And that when we ask other aspects about it, how, um, for example, there was a, a question in the chat about um, active learning and other ways of teaching and different ways of teaching. Um, and so two findings that we have on that, one of which is we also ask about um, course materials, what component of it do you like? What's good, what works for you, what doesn't, um, and that. And across all of those dimensions, those using OER are rating it as, as good or better with the single exception of supplemental material provided by a publisher. Every other characteristic that we ask about OER comes out at least as good and typically better. Um, obviously, and when you hit cost, it's like no contest, but for all of the other aspects, faculty believe the product, the OER product for them is overall better than commercial. Um, the, the other piece is um, we, have, so just to address a piece that I mentioned in the chat, which is um, where we were looking at a number of things, which is um, how do you teach in this active learning or other ways of teaching? Um, and so we took a number of questions from uh, the, the deeper learning literature and pieces and asked faculty members uh, how, how much of that they did in their courses how well they thought the materials supported the, the, those aspects of teaching. Um, we're, we're not at the point where the, I, that we're, we believe the results are robust enough to report in a detailed manner, but we can say that what we're seeing is that uh, similar to what we saw from the more general measures of quality is that those faculty members using OER are reporting that what they're using is as good or better than commercial publishers with that. But if what you were hoping to see was a massive change in how people teach, um, that we're not seeing. It is not that people who are using OER are teaching fundamentally differently than people using commercial. And when we ask about how do you use the material, the 5R components, there's virtually no difference and how faculty use material yeah. from commercial publishers versus OER. Yes. Um, so wanting to, was able to update uh, the duplicate uh, graph. Uh, sorry about that. Um, it actually, the graph was correct for fully online. Um, it's actually the combination uh, was the incorrect and those values are a little lower for the strongly agree um, just for that awareness and we'll update this in the um, full files. And also um, this will be always available on our website as well. Um, I saw one 
question around student opinions. And uh, I would say that is one of our biggest missing data sets, um, one of the hardest data sets to get and one that we would love to. Um, so that's one thing that if anyone really uh, don't, if anyone wants uh, to do a project with that, please reach out. Um, we would love to be able to access, um, especially working with people who are actually in institutions or have, um, so surveying people within Cal State, um, community colleges, um, UCs, anything like that would be great. Um, so yeah, that's one part of the project that we really wanna know. And it's often interesting, especially when we talk about um, something like these statements, which are faculty perceptions of the use for students. Um, but we don't actually have yet the actual students who are sort of considered the user's customers um, as well. Um, and so that's something that is always of interest, um, though it's been great in this conference and many others to have student perspectives come in and students are actually some of the major drivers for initiatives and uptake of OER on some campuses. And um, another point here in the, uh, I know we're running low on time, so I just wanna quickly do this. There's a question about uh, do faculty members that uh, in point of my OER and commercial use was the same as or the question was, um, do faculty edit their primary cor course text? Um, and the answer that we, we have is we asked a, a series of questions. One, um, uh, do you teach, do you, the remix piece, do you change the order? Do you use it in different ways? Do you add other material to it? Do you do, you pro, do, you do corrections to it? Do you drop material from your courses? Um, and what we see is that um, there is a fairly high number of proportion of faculty members who do all of those things to some extent, um, but the, the, there's very little difference between that and what they do between a commercial and OER. And that is not necessarily that they're doing something different. The biggest takeaway for we have for a lot of that is many faculty just ignore licensing restrictions. So they may not be doing what they are doing, may not be supported by the license of the material they have, but they're doing it anyway. Yeah, um, and some of that data is available in our last report. We have a whole section on that. Um, and then uh, it is going to be some of um, upcoming reports. We'll talk about how faculty use. Um, so yeah, I think uh, definitely reach out to us. Um, I'll put up our contact again. Um, so yeah, our, so our general email is info at bayviewanalytics.com. I'm Julia uh, at Bayview Analytics, and then there's Jeff. Um, we're also LinkedIn or Twitter and more than happy to engage. But yes, uh, we will more than happy to help get this data out. If you want this for your own department, for your own research, for grants or anything, we're happy to provide some information. Um, and any questions that come up, uh, since this is a massive amount of data and numbers that I went through, more than happy to go through again as well. So thank everyone. Um, and definitely thanks to Shelly and everyone for inviting us to this. This has been a great conference. Thank you so much to both of you. This was a fabulous OER data <laughs> journey. <laughs> We've got lots of numbers and lots of ideas to work from. We look forward to seeing future survey research as well. And I hope everyone will continue to visit sessions throughout the day. There's still more to come and enjoy day three, the last day of the OER conference. Thanks again to both Julia and Jeff for being here. And thank you for everyone for coming. <laughs>